you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, we're talking about mothers. She cooks, she cleans, she comforts, she corrects. She has six pairs of hands and eyes in the back of her head. We call her mom. For some, this word will conjure up the image of a June Cleaver type, uh, complete with her lace apron, pearls, singing lullabies and baking brownies, while she kisses away a child's hot tears. Maybe others will think of the Irma Bombeck model. She'll drive a wood-paneled station wagon, and her hobby is dust. Whatever the type of mom you think of, no one has more influence than a mother. For better or for worse, she will forever impact the life of her child. Tough and tender, wise and warm, a mother must be all things to her family at all times. That's quite a job description. And anyone who is a mother who has watched one in action knows that there's no career that's more demanding, more endangered, and more needed in today's society. One thing is for certain, as I already said on this day, that I couldn't talk about anything that more touches our lives because either you are one or you have one, a mother. Luke chapter 1 introduces us to a special mother. Because if you have a mother, and we all do, you can show your love for her, whether she is present here this morning, whether she's alive and present somewhere else around here, or if she's passed away either out of your life or maybe out of this world. You can still honor and express your love toward her. And the Bible shows us how we can do that. Secondly, if you're not a mom or are going to be a mom someday or are a man and never will be a mom, there's something we can learn from Mary's life. Something about the devotion that God honors. Something about the character and quality of life that God wants. This morning may I introduce you or reintroduce you to Mary, the mother of James. And that's the book that we're studying. But this morning, Mary, the mother of James, and most importantly, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now I'm going to give you a quiz, and I want you to say the answer with me, okay, after I ask these questions. And I think that you'll all, they're pretty self-explanatory questions, okay? So get ready. It's a time you can speak. Who is presented as the woman in the whole world that God picked to raise his son? Mary. Very good. And thus, who is presented as the most honored woman in the whole Bible to have that privilege? Mary. And who is a living, breathing example of Proverbs 31 in everyday ordinary life. Mary, that's right. And without exception, who is probably the most beloved and the best known woman in the world, about which the whole world, or most of it, celebrates a holiday that she's deeply involved with at Christmas. Who is that? Mary. Now that's more times than Mary's been mentioned in most Protestant churches in the last century, I'd say, right? Because we have a habit of not talking much about her. Why? because of the excesses. But I think sometimes in the excesses, we've left out the reality. Ever since I was a little boy, I've heard countless sermons about the Proverbs 31 woman. And as I've listened to those, I've always had kind of wondering who she was. You know, who could ever? I mean, they almost walk on water. Well, you know, there's a woman that embodies that virtue. And of course, there are many. But the one we're going to look at this morning is Mary Mary, a mother, mentioned 20 times in the Bible, is such a portrait of godliness, of humility, and of yieldedness. Mary, the mother of James and of Jesus, stands in the Scripture as an example to every one of us, men or women or children, of devotion to God and of faithfulness. Mary, her strengths, her struggles, they're all laid out in the Bible. And we can benefit greatly from looking at her today and perhaps many more times in the future, but especially today on this day when we honor mothers. Luke gives us, and if you're in Luke chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 26, but Luke gives us insights into this incredible woman's life. She's mentioned 20 times in the Bible. 13 of them come from Luke. 65% of all of our knowledge about Mary comes through Luke, who writes Luke and Acts. And as we turn to this first chapter, we find out the qualities, the qualities that God admires in a mother and in a woman so much that he picked her out to raise his son. 
Number one in verse 26, and I'll read 26 through 28, we see that Mary was, first of all, sought out by God. Verse 26 says, now in the sixth month, sixth month of what? And we should always, when we're studying the Bible, ask a lot of questions. Who, what, when, where, how? Why six months? Well, it was six months prior that the angel had spoken to Mary's cousin, Elizabeth. And now six months later, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Galilee, Galilee means circle. Uh, It's 20 cities around the Sea of Galilee, which Hiram, king of Tyre, called Kabul, worthless. Uh, People didn't think much of Galilee, but Jesus was from Galilee, and Nazareth was in Galilee. And so this angel comes to Nazareth, and if you know anything about local custom, he couldn't have come into her house because men weren't to be seen in women's houses that weren't married. And so most likely, and most Bible scholars think, that Mary was in the special cave where the water supply for the whole region was. And every woman knew that well because they had to go back and forth all day long. Every drop of water used for everything was carried in a pot on the head to the house. And so probably, and and it's a very precious spot, Mary was there getting that. And there was a virgin, verse 27, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph and the descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And, verse 28, coming in. Gabriel came into something, probably this cave where the spring was, and the well was used to to bring the water up out of the rock. And he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, God sought her out. And she didn't go around with her antenna up saying, Hey, you're looking for a great woman, here I am, you know. He sought her. And, And I think immediately of the fact that God is in the people seeking business. God has sought out, and Mary joins so many others that God has sought. God sought out Adam and Eve in the garden. They didn't seek him. They hid from him. God sought out Noah in the pre-flood world and, and revealed himself to him. God sought Abram in Ur. God sought out Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. God is in the people seeking business. He still is. But keep reading verse 29. You could label verse 29, who, me? I mean, look at her response. But she was greatly troubled. Now, that's a good sign of a humble person, and that's the next point, that she was humble. She was sought by God, and she was humble. Because a humble person, when they're honored, they can't believe it. They go, me? (laughs) Me? You know, they're just in shock. I don't mean they're acting. I mean they're honest. And that's what she says. She was greatly troubled at his statement that, Hail, Mary, um, you're, you're favored, and the Lord is with you. And she was pondering. She was just swirling this in her mind. What would that man who came in to probably the cave of the well, what did he mean by that? I mean, I'm sure she dropped her bucket and looked at him. And this shows us that there were no errors in Mary's life, no pride. There was just a humble, troubled heart that anyone would even say such a thing to her because she knew her own heart. And certainly God knew her. But that leads us to the 30th verse, which I think is most important. And if if there's something you hold on to, this is an important one. Look at the 30th verse. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Interesting word, favor. It's the word grace. You know what he says? Mary, you have found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You say, was this something special? Was she a, a sinless woman? Never sinned? Was she someone who had had, uh, uh, escaped the taint of sin and that's how she got to bear Jesus? And I want to say that, sadly enough, that that the longer this goes, the the more enlarged this this fanciful notion that Mary was sinless is. And and it wasn't assumed that she was sinless until recently, uh, in the last 150 years, and now it's assumed that her mother was sinless. And if you keep going, it goes all the way back and somehow Eve is sinless. And I don't know how that works, but that's not what it says. It says she found favor. Now keep your finger right there and go back to the first book of the Bible. I want to show you what it means to find favor in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6. Because remember, the best way to understand the Bible is not to listen to some notable scholar, but to read the Bible. Because the Bible explains the Bible. And the Bible is the best commentary in the Bible. And the first commentary I go to when I'm studying the Bible is the Bible. 
And that's why a great tool is something like the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge that has 500, 600,000 cross-references and to find everything the Bible says on anything else. And this is the first occurrence of this word, find favor. In Genesis 6 and verse uh, 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Do you know what that word favor is? It's the same as the New Testament word favor. It's the word, the New Testament word, grace. Do you know what? Noah found God's grace. He was in a despicable world, a world that was headed toward destruction, and God just put and poured out on Noah his grace. And this is the first occurrence of grace in the Bible. Now, does that mean Noah was sinless? Well, don't turn there, but by chapter 9, he's drunken, unclothed, and in a heap on the bottom, on the ground of his tent. Certainly wasn't sinless, but he was a recipient of God's grace. Certainly anybody that's born again is not sinless, but they are certainly a recipient of God's grace. So back to Luke chapter 1. Let's read it that way. Luke 1 and verse 30. And the angel said, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found grace with God. What does that mean? It means that Mary had partook of God's grace. She was saved by God. There's some people that just are repulsed at the thought that Mary sinned. Well, the Bible says all have sinned. And Jesus is the only one that escapes sin because Jesus was perfect. He was God the Son. Everyone else has sinned. Everyone. Every man, woman, child that's ever lived. No matter how noble or saintly are sinners. We are all sinners. Mary was a sinner. But Mary found grace. She partook of God's grace. She was saved by God. She discovered the grace of God, which is literally the word order of this verse. But Mary, it says, do not fear, for you have found, and the word is literally discovered, and have been discovered by, as passive, you have been discovered by the grace of God. What a joy. As Mary joined the countless multitude in this world and who have already gone on, who are heirs of life eternal by God's grace. That's the only way to get to heaven. It's the only way. I was thinking about this. Uh, we were standing uh, a while back in front of this gigantic tank of fish. Huge. Two stories high and just full of fish. And I was looking at those massive fish, and I was thinking, those fish would have to be born again to enter the kingdom of man. You get it? They can't live outside that water. If they were where I was, they would die unless they were born again into the kingdom of man. Did you know we cannot enter the kingdom of God if we have not been born again? into the kingdom of God. Mary was born again. She got a new heart. And she received the marvelous grace of our loving Lord. The songwriter puts it this way. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount upward, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. She received that grace. Her study of the word of God had led her into the open arms, as she confesses a little bit later in verse 47. She says, my spirit is rejoiced in God, my Savior. She found her Savior. She knew she needed his grace. She was discovered by his grace, and she partook of it. And I want to encourage you, because this morning, uh, some people say, oh, you know, I could never be like Mary. I mean, Every Jewish woman in this world would love to have been the mother of the Messiah, but that's past. But look what really happened, because Mary had an incredible ministry opportunity given to her by God in verse 31. And behold, the angel said, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. Now, so far, so good. Any mother can do that, have a son or a daughter. But listen, and you shall name him Jesus And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, which is yet future, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Now, the rest of us can never have that. I want you to think through with me. Look look at what God offered her, and look at what we could have this morning. Mary was given the incredible ministry opportunity of producing within her body tiny little hands that would someday touch lepers with a healing touch and give them newness. Mary had the opportunity within her womb to form a mouth on that little baby that would speak the word of God. 
Mary had the incredible ministry opportunity of feeling little feet kicking within her that would someday walk the roads of Israel and spread the gospel. Wow, what an incredible ministry opportunity. But wait, not at all the lesson what happened to Mary, but isn't that the opportunity that every mom today has? Doesn't every mom have the opportunity to teach little ones that the greatest joy in all the world is to be touched by Jesus and to be healed from the dreadful leprosy of sin? Doesn't every mom today have the privilege of using their mouth to share the power of the gospel with their children and teaching those children to likewise share the gospel with all who they meet and so they can turn in faith to Jesus Christ? Can't we all do that and share in Mary's great opportunity? And as a mother, can't we start their feet toward serving the Lord in many ways? Yes. What an opportunity God has given mothers. And what's interesting, listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He says, women are equal with men. Oh, hold on. Well, he says they're saved from second-rate ministry because the men in the church are to teach and lead. That's what the Bible says. God has gender-specific roles. He says, men in the church teach and lead. Men in the home are to be the head and leader of the house. So, so women are second place, right? No. He said they are, they are equal with the men because though the men teach and lead, the mothers bear and raise the teachers and leaders. Who's the greatest influence on that ministry in life? The one that brought them to their first knowledge of the Savior. And Paul says, women... Don't fear. You are saved from second-rate, second-place ministry. You are equal in teaching and leading because you bear and lead the teachers and leaders. Well, this morning, what's a way that we can really love our moms? I mean, what a day. The whole world sets aside a day to love and honor moms. Let me just give you a couple. One is, let's say you don't have a mom. She's not here anymore. She won't speak to you. She's gone on. She's she's out of this world. What can we do? Well, we can talk about her. Do you talk about your mom? Do you think through your life? I I really have to do this a lot right now because uh, every night we have Bible time, song time, prayer time, and then we have tell us stories, mom and dad. And we've been doing this for years, and we have to really think. And what it makes me do is it makes me examine and go back in my mind to growing up. And I'll tell you what, if you think long enough, And sometimes it doesn't take very long to think. You can think about the wonders of what your mom was and did. I mean, I can see my mom working far in the night. I can see her sewing those things in the so I can see her cooking. I can see her cleaning. She was the last one up. She was at night. She still was up and went to bed after us. First one up in the morning cooking. I mean, talk about them. The scriptures say that they live on in our words. What does God do? Look at the Bible. The wonders of Mary and the devotion of Hannah and the care of Moses' mother, Jochebed, are all in the Bible. They're honored. Their lives still speak, as the writer of Hebrews said. And every time I hear of Monica, the mother of St. Augustine, or I hear of, of Susanna Wesley, the mother of Charles and John and, and 17 other children, those who faithfully loved their children and prayed for their children and taught their children, the influence of a distant life touches me. You know what you can do this morning? If you haven't done it a long time, talk about your mother. If she's not alive, tell someone about her, something you love and remember. And when you saw God's specialness in her life expressed through her, his love, But if they are present, you need to really let them know how they touched your life. Proverbs 31, 28 says this, Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. When's the last time you praised your mother or your wife for being God's special gift? Hannah was in Mary's family tradition, so she spoke of her keeping her life at work. Mary's prayer, which we'll look at next week, starting in verse 46, is extolling God's hand in another woman's life. You know, today, before you get in the car, if your mom's around, you ought to tell her. Think for a minute. Tell her something that she did that's wonderful, of a way she touched her life, maybe her smile, her voice, her, her soft yet strong touch, maybe her prayers or her phone calls or her letters or her endless cooking and ministry and sewing and cleaning. But there should be from us audibly a blessing to our moms 
And it would be such a joy if it got to be a habit that this was only the start. And not just today, but all throughout the year, we would rise up and call them blessed. Why? Because God has chosen to make mothers such an important part of the fabric of life. And he has told us that if we honor those qualities of God, that their lives live on through us. I hope you'll honor your mother today. Honor her memory or call her personally and honor her in person. If you have a mom in your home, that you'll honor her as your mother. The husbands, you'll honor your wives and tell them that they are blessed to the Lord. Let's bow together as we close out this time. Father, I thank you that you chose through the instrument of a humble servant, through a virgin who never knew a man, to be surrounded by the glory Shekinah cloud and for the Spirit of God to put within her the very infinite, eternal Son of God. How I thank you that this woman raised your Son and lived the life of your Word, which we'll see in the days ahead, so mirrors what you want a woman to be and all of us to be. And I pray that at this time when we honor mothers that we will honor your great plan because you, in the fullness of the time, sent forth your Son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem us who are under the curse of the law that we might receive forgiveness of sins. And because you came, and because you came under the law and you came through a woman, it was your perfect plan, O Father, for our redemption. And we worship you for that great redemption this morning. I pray that even this morning, for some who have come, perhaps just to honor a loved one, that in the quietness of this moment, that they would turn their eyes upon Jesus and look and live. For one look at the Savior brings life everlasting. For Jesus' sake, amen.